Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Bernard Horn. He's the founder and principal at Polaris Capital Management. He's giving us a masterclass on global value investing coming up right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquirers Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. I, I saw, I, lo- I love that little um, tidbit in one of the notes that you started out hand entering the data into your Apple II computer. Yeah. Um... So this goes back to 1980, right? So I started my first company in 1980. In fact, we're just we're just interviewing a young uh, new graduate with a, in a com- with a computer science degree, and you know he asked us how how um, are we? You know, technology is, is is technology an important part of our firm? I said, well, it started out that way. And I was explaining that my first Apple II computer, which had 64 kilobytes of memory <laughs> and a cassette tape recorder. So you had to load the operating system from a cassette tape. You put it in the recorder. You had an AV jack that went into the computer from the cassette and you had to time the play button on the recorder. So you hit the play button and the return button on the computer and it read out the operating system into the computer and that uh, that's how you got, that's how you booted the computer up. Uh, and you know, then you're up and running for as long as, as long as the computer would stay, stay there. But the, it's probably funny, the I, Apple. T- I had a, I had a Commodore 64 and it was the same, oh, yeah. had the tape, right. had the, the tape and you had, you had Did some you really? crazy little, uh, that I, I could remember by, I had it by memory at the time. I was completely lost now, but you had this crazy little command string you had to type in. Right. Yeah. To get it, to get it to go. <laughs> so, those are, those are. so you started a, a precursor to Polaris in uh, in 1980. Same same strategy, same focus. Yeah, ex- basically exactly the same strategy, just many evolutions ago, but basically the same fundamental value underpinning cash flow underpinning the concept of value. Um, and, you know, back then it was, you know, there were a, a dozen countries in the world you could invest in. And, you know, uh, I had to kind of learn that all from the ground up. And it was not just the investment side of it, but the operational side was not trivial back then. Because, I, I, you know, yeah, just, I can't just, imagine. So that, that, that's a, that's a, that was, was that unusual to be invested globally in 1980? It was very unusual. I mean, you, it was un-American in the minds of some people. Uh, the Dow Jones 30 was sort of what everybody focused on, if you can imagine a world like that. The S&P 500 was kind of just being used as uh, an investment concept. Dean LeBaron had set up a battery march, a financial management with Evan Shulman, who was the Fortran programmer who did a lot of the trading systems and the, and the data systems, but they were very avant-garde in the business back then because they suggested that people actually might, uh, might invest in the market portfolio, which was the S&P 500. And that was a shock to everybody in the business. If you, you know, it was very disruptive, you know? as we think about the word today. But I, you know, I interviewed him before I started up my company. And uh, at the time when I was studying uh, finance theory at MIT at the Sloan School, there was a lot of literature suggesting that if you invested outside your home country, you know, you got a tremendous amount of risk reduction because the correlations, especially back then, the global economy was the global economy, but it really wasn't so integrated. And consequently, you could find companies that were in their own world selling electricity into the Spanish market that had nothing to do with the rest of the world, only you know the industrial production in, in Spain. 
So there were great low correlation assets that you could buy all around the world. And, you know, Spanish utilities in 1982, 83, gave you a 14% dividend yield and uh, a whole lot of upside and, and lot, not so much downside because the economy ultimately, ultimately was growing. So it was, so, so my idea of, you know, at least the academic literature at the time suggested that the market portfolio wasn't the Dow Jones 30. It could be the S&P 500, but I thought it was way broader than that, right? And so I just felt like if you're really gonna, the market portfolio should be the global equity universe. And that's basically what I started out doing in the early eighties, um, buying kind of at the time low PE stocks. Although I knew because I was a co-op student at, at the Gillette company for over a five year period. And one stint I did was at the financial reporting department, which was responsible for assembling the financial statements for all of Gillette's vast global uh, subsidiaries and putting, consolidating all those financials up into a consolidated financial statement. And I knew from looking at the subsidiary in Belgium and Germany and Mexico that the accounting standards back then were drastically different from one country to another. So when we were trying to convert the, the subsidiary financial statements from all these other countries into the parent company financial statements, I knew pretty quickly that you know, the world was very different once you step outside your home country. And that's when I, you know, that's when, I, and, and I knew too that there were many strange accounting um, concepts for better, for lack of a better word. Um, and the CFO at the time at Gillette was Tom Skelly, a wonderful, wonderful man and an extraordinarily knowledgeable person. But he, even though he was CFO of this big global company, you know, he would always wonder, you know, his German CFO at the Braun company, which sold shavers and, and a bunch of other things, he was always surprised that the earnings of that subsidiary were rock solid in a steady, and he knew it was impossible for that to happen. And, to, and he would always be amused that he could never seem to find wherever the reserves were that that German CFO had squirreled away so that he could pull them out whenever they had a down quarter and everything kind of was smoothed out. So I knew to be skeptical of, of financial statements, you know, in the mid seventies. And, uh, and I knew that the cash flow, you know, the cash flow statement was more difficult for everybody to manipulate and it is today. Uh, here we are, you know, like 40 something years later so I always felt like cash flow A was, from an accounting point of view, more of, a, more of a pure statement of what a company's really earning. And quite frankly, you know, from my perspective, no investment is, is worth anything uh, except for the cash flow that it generates for the holders of that security or that company or whatever it might be. So, you know, I learned very early on that that cash flow was was the primary metric of value, and kind of we've been doing that ever since. So yeah, I mean, going back to the '80s, the the basic tenets of what we do, the the value concepts that we use today, uh, were very much born on that. The whole DNA of what we do today was born out of this academic research that said you can get better low correlations. You mix them together, you drop your volatility. You don't really sacrifice much in return because equities are pretty much going to earn the same return around the world. And, and back then it was kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. You could go, go around the world finding companies that nobody even heard of before. Obviously they were heard of by the locals, but the mispricing of assets from country to country was stark and very, very fun and, and, uh, and make a decent amount of money. But there were, you know, there were risks like everything, right? You, it's not all upside, <laughs> there's a lot of downside. And, you know, I lived, you know, in, in, in a fairly short period of time, I lived through more crises in international markets because I was just in them. You know, Hong Kong, you know, had a minor real estate crash. It killed the market for a while. And, you know, I was talking about the German, the Spanish utilities. 
you know, there was a reason that they were yielding 14%, 13, 14% was because uh, there was a minor uh, economic crisis there. So no matter where you were, you were, you were, the frequency that you would experience crises was much greater. So I felt like I had a much, you know, quicker baptism by fire, if you will, and, and got used to navigating these, the, this volatility and understanding how you might mix it together to create you know, better portfolios. When I, when I look at the long history of uh, equity pricing, the, that early 80s must have been, a, that was a very cheap period in the States, perhaps a very cheap period globally. What was it like from your perspective? It was, it, it, it was very, there were clearly some undervaluations primarily born out of the 70s because the 70s was really the first time in at least US stock market history where you had, um, you know, you had stagflation, tremendous inflation. The most important aspect of that is that it was unexpected inflation. And consequently, lots of things had to adjust that had never adjusted before, you know, because you had the 60s, which was the golden era of US equities um, the 50s was kind of a growth period when everybody came back from the war, had lots of babies, economy was growing like gangbusters that fed into the 60s. And so the 70s was like this massive shock to the system where you had, you know, cheap oil was going to be there forever. And all of a sudden, people were lined up at gas stations. So you had tremendous inflation, stagnated the economy and bond investments that had been, you know, I had, you know, widows come into my office in the early 80s who had, who, you know, whose husbands had bought them bonds in the 60s for their retirement, right? And a four or 5% bond, uh, you know, you can imagine what the duration risk on that longer term bond was when the coupon was at four or five or six, in the 60s, then the 70s hit, and T-bill yields went to double digit, right? And long-term bond yields went up, and the value of these the, these poor widows' bond portfolios was you know dropped in half. You know, so like a one or two percent change in a 30-year gives you a r real nice downdraft in your in your portfolio, right? So, you know, so, so I was trying to do financial planning for people to get money under management, and that come in with these portfolios. That, were, that had been devastated by the 70s. So there was tremendous value in, in that context. The problem was that for, for a lot of people, the opportunity was the result of their portfolios getting pretty, pretty beat up. Um, and quite frankly, the memory of that inflation, and I think this is what people don't really appreciate about unexpected inflation. And to some degree, that memory exists today in the minds of many investors, but you know, the the actual double digit inflation in the 70s only lasted like a, a year or two, but the, but the interest yields were way higher than inflation and, and persisted for years after that. And as a result, kept valuations low. So to come back to your question, you know, the, the memory of that, that decade of the 70s when equity prices flatlined for a decade in the US, which had never happened before, that that created this, um, you know, this real angst about, you know, should, should I invest, I don't want to invest in bonds, equities had been, had been decimated. So there's no real money going into it. a very different, a, def, a very different world than you have today when every week there's another trillion dollars stimulus, you know, free money being showered on people and, you know, like this tremendous money just pouring into all these various assets. So it was a very great, it was a very interesting time in the investment business. And there were tremendous values, but at the same time, you had to believe that it was going to someday turn around, which, you know, starting in 82, which was fortuitous for me because I started, you know, my first business in 1980, you know, it really started to turn around. Volcker's, you know, high, in, high interest rates to tame inflation worked. And um, the only thing that persisted was these things called COLAs, C-O-L-A, cost of living adjustment clauses 
that were basically in almost all contracts back then, including labor contracts. So wages, prices, input costs to companies all sort of got indexed into the pricing and it created you know, this feed into inflation that persisted for a long time. And it wasn't until you know, we had a, a, a recession that quieted that down and then people had to go out and get jobs and, and so forth. So that, it, was a, it was a very different time. When you look at the investment landscape now, that some would say that the, the, the COVID shutdown has created some unexpected inflation. There's an argument that it's transitory. How do you think about that uh, and put it into the, the, your investment process, if you would? Yeah, the, um, I've, been a, I've been a very, I've been saying for years, uh, and I'll come back to this when it comes to our investment process, but for years we've been, ex, we've been analyzing a great deal of deflation in the prices of the goods and services that the companies that we can invest in, you know, they've had a very difficult time pricing higher than inflation. You know, when I worked at Gillette, the product managers in the 70s, because of all that inflation, their, their instruction from the C-suite was to be sure that your products were priced uh, ahead of inflation. Um, that uh, pre-COVID, that was not so easy. And many companies have had a very difficult time doing so. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think... Um, so I think we're coming, going into COVID, we were in a period of, of deflation coming out of it. You know, we had this biggest working capital cycle in the history of, of business. You know, you shut down the whole global economy. Uh, you don't have any sales coming in. So you collect all your receivables as quickly as you can, pay your uh, payables off if you can, uh, work your inventory down, and don't order anything because you don't know looking into the abyss whether the economy when the economy is going to restart. Oh, it'll be a few weeks. It'll be six weeks. Then it turned out to be a quarter, and it was two or three quarters. <laughs> so, but then when everybody restarted that that global economy, the working the working capital cycle has restarted, and it's the first time that kind of the global economy has restarted all at the same time. So yes, there are shortages. I think you throw in the, 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 the stimulus, shutting down schools so parents can't go to work, uh, daycare is not there, um, people are being paid unemployment insurance as a safety net, but that's sticking too long probably from where it is. So this restart of the working capital cycle clearly um, is putting upward pressure on companies uh, and, they're, and, and, and they're able to actually uh, raise prices, which is for the last 10 to 15 years and, and longer for many companies, you know, a real newfound uh, thing for some managers have never been able to raise prices. Now is the first time they're actually out there raising prices. So they're feeling pretty good about it. And the one thing, as far as the transitory question you ask, the one thing that I see that reminds me a lot about what I just spoke on in the 70s is that companies are telling us, we ask them, Gee, you're getting all these price increases. You're, you can't ship stuff. How are you dealing with those costs? The normal answer pre-COVID was, well, you know, we're getting hit by higher energy costs, but we're able to save money over here because we can't pass it on in pricing. Therefore, we're having to really keep our, our, our operation running more and more efficiently all the time. And that's a continuous improvement process, right? Today, uh, you ask the same question, and they're saying, well, we've negotiated with our customers that we can pass along the price increase. And uh, that's happening more and more. It almost reminds me of that period in the 70s. So as far as is inflation going to be transitory? Um, I would have said pre-COVID, no, not, not at all. It's it, Moore's law will come back with a vengeance and it will drive prices down. And if that doesn't do it, low cost countries where people are willing to work 50 weeks of, the, of a year, seven days a week with two weeks off, that deflationary pressure on labor is gonna persist. Um, so uh, look, I think it's probably gonna be, I, I think that those powerful forces 
uh, of the deflationary forces are probably going to come back. Um, but in certain sectors, we're definitely seeing pricing power that we haven't seen in 15 plus years. And I think it, I think it will be a little bit longer than transitory. But of course, the definition of transitory in the minds of central bankers these days, you know, central bankers have been trying to create inflation for over a decade. Um, so if that's their that if that's their definition of transitory, I don't know, I don't know what what it really means for us in terms of inflation pressures. But uh, but yeah, I think that that's kind of the um, yeah. When you when you launched in uh, in the eighties, you were talking about you go to an individual country and you'd find that um, it was uncorrelated to the rest of the world. And it seems that we we live in a much more interconnected world now. And probably COVID is a pretty good demonstration of how interconnected we actually are. How uh, does that change the way that you invest? And do you agree with that characterization that we're becoming increasingly interconnected? I don't think there's any doubt we're more interconnected. So I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, as far as building portfolios in an interconnected world, how can we do that and still somehow achieve these correlations? And I think that is a, that one has to be a lot more careful in the construction to achieve that these days, especially when it seems like every day you come in, you look at the screen, and you know somebody pushed a button that says today's a value day and then the next day they press the button and it's a growth day and it seems like where's all the low correlation right um so i i'd have to say that there are still clear examples though where a company is invested or does business in a particular geographic area or a niche in some industry somewhere in the world and no matter what happens uh, on Wall Street or Washington, uh, their business is gonna keep chugging along and it's not gonna be particularly correlated that well with the, the, the overall market. And we can see that in our screens, we still have a surprising number of companies, more than half that come through with low betas. And we do a ton of work on looking at what's what's beta, what's good beta, what's bad beta. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many hours we've invested in that very subject, but it's a very interesting problem because the world is definitely interconnected. Uh, you have to really be careful in your stock selection. At the end of the day, what we look at, as I said earlier, is we just really focus on cash flows. So we try to identify what's the ultimate source of that company's cash flow? And is it correlated with a whole bunch of other things in our portfolio? And we can find a lot of companies where, you know, the units that they sell, the prices that they sell at are not necessarily correlated with what, what else is going on. And we try to find as many of those as possible. Of course, the bigger the companies you invest in, the more globally diversified they are, the more interconnected they are. And, and I think, you know, we've always been of the view that we're completely agnostic as to the countries we invest in, the industries we invest in, or the size companies. And a good part of our portfolio tends to be, you know, not large cap, not mega cap, I, I would say. Um, so we, you know, we just try to do the best we can. We try to understand every company's cash flow, the source of that cash flow, and be sure that we don't have a huge bet on some factors, all of which contribute to the cash flows on a big part of our portfolio. Uh, but you can find, you can clearly find a bunch of companies that are not connected. But the stock prices, you know, it's like they say, you know, in a crisis, the only thing that goes up are correlations. <laughs> and so the fundamentals in the business could be perfectly uncorrelated, but the stock prices all go down at the same time. And that's what you have to live through as a value investor and as, as an, any kind of investor these days i think there's been an effort i think globally to uh, make sure that accounting from country to country is reasonably standard so that if for us implementation which is distinct from gap practiced in the us but they're mm -hmm. still reasonably comparable do you find that the accounting is it is more tractable now than it was when you when you started out and is that does that process still have some ways to go it's definitely more uh, more integrated uh, among the accounting regulatory bodies. They do try to 
make it a little bit better, but there are still some pretty big differences. And um, I would say overall, the accounting bodies try to be consistent, but there are still some pretty big differences among countries. The bigger differences though are, are within sectors. Um, for instance, like a steel company's income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement is gonna look very different than a software company. And that's really where we see these, these uh, accounting differences. And they will, will likely persist just because the industries and the businesses themselves are so very different. And I think that's where we tend to spend a lot of our time just trying to uh, decipher what those differences are and adjust for them and try to automate as much as possible those adjustments. Given that you've got uh, a global portfolio and you're, you're, you're tracking a very large number of com uh, companies, how do you then whittle down from that very large portfolio to what ends up in the, uh, what, the very large screen to what ends up in the, in, in the portfolio? Well, we, we start with um, a massive amount of data. We have, we have a database, which is most people can get at them these days, but there are about 40 plus thousand publicly traded companies in the world. And that's our, that's our universe. Uh, now, if you look at that universe, a large part of it are tiny companies that are virtually, most of which, uh, a lot of them are uninvestable. I mean, $25 million market cap stocks, these are kind of small operations. It's, you know, you can't buy a whole lot of them, but they do populate the database and they are available, especially for some of our small cap funds. We have two small cap funds. Um, so those are available. Um, but so we take this universe and really what we're doing is trying to find, uh, you know, a, a very, the uh, question is which companies are priced to give us a return that's gonna allow us to beat the benchmark. So we have like a corporate manager would have a weighted average cost of capital, a discount rate, a hurdle rate. We have what we call a Polaris Capital Global Cost of Equity. And it uh, starts at 7% real after inflation. And that's what index funds over many decades have returned to equity investors. So our clients can take their money, put it in an index fund. And as long as the 7% that's occurred for the last 75 plus years is the same return you could get in the future, then 7% is the number that we have to beat, right? So if we give people back a 7% after inflation return, what do they need us for, right? They can go get that in an index fund. So the only way that we should invest in anything is if we can beat that return, we say, at least start with 200 basis points. So we say our hurdle rate is the benchmark return of seven plus another 2%. And then because we're investing around the world, we do something that's rather elegant and but relatively simple. We also try to adjust for the exchange rate risk that is inherent whenever you step outside your home country. And and to solve for that problem, we look to the efficiency of fixed income markets, and we believe they're extraordinarily efficient. The interest rate arbitrage is quite strong in fixed income markets. So we look at the real bond rates in, from one country to the other, and uh, we add that real bond rate to our 9%. So you have 7% plus 2 plus the real bond rate. And uh, the idea is that if we take our client money and go out outside their home country, wherever that client might be. And let's suppose that Brazil has a, you know, has a, a 3% real yield on their 10 year. That's the fixed income markets telling us that if you put all your money in Brazilian reals, uh, you, you think you're getting another 3% over your US dollar rate, but probably the real is gonna depreciate against the dollar by 3% a year and you're gonna be back into dollars at about the same price. So we wanna make sure that if we do go invest in an equity outside and we do suffer a 3% exchange rate loss, that when we're back into the client's home country, we're still got that 7% plus the 2% and we're justified our existence. So that's kind of the way we think about. So we take this universe, find companies that are priced to give us that hurdle rate and that gives us our working list and from there we go on uh, to 
dig deep into the financial statements of the company and try to find which of those co companies are, are fairly priced. You know, they, they look optically very cheap, but maybe they're cheap for a good reason because, you know, whatever. It's not well managed. It's in a declining industry and so on and so forth. And our job is to find out which of those companies are mispriced such that we can you know, make that excess return, you know, going forward over time. And that's kind of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you include in that some uh, company visits. How often are you visiting the companies in the portfolio? Pretty much all the time. I mean, we, we typically spend about 25% of our time on the road. We haven't obviously done that last year, but we look forward to doing that again. Uh, we see a lot of companies coming through Boston. It's one of the centers for financial investment management in the country. So pretty much most companies that want to talk to investors work their way through Boston at one point. So we have a chance to see them here. Now, whether that'll happen post COVID is, a, is an interesting question. I think the burden will be on us more to go out and, and see people as opposed to waiting for them to come see us going forward. But uh, clearly understanding the database is important. Understanding the financial statements is re really important. Reading the financial, re the annual report from the back cover to the front, you know, going through all the notes to the financial statements, it's there where you find a lot of reasons why the stock is undervalued because there'll be a huge pension liability. Maybe the, the leverage, maybe the terms of the debt, you know, are such that, you know, the capital structure will impair the ability of, of uh, shareholders to get money out of the company in terms of cash flow. So, and then you have to decide what companies are, are well managed. I mean, are, 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 if the management team, quite frankly, is taking that cash flow that looks like they're generating, but they're wasting it and destroying shareholder value, well, that's probably one reason why the stock might be inexpensive. And, uh, and trying to find the companies where the management teams really get it where they have good, strong leadership, where, they've, where they really know why, you know, they, they take a dollar and turn it into two and, and have some left over for shareholders. That's, that's the hard part because markets are extraordinarily efficient and trying to find those companies that are mispriced that are also going to deliver strong, sustainable cash flow to their shareholders. That's the, that's the thing where we have to spend all of our time and that's how we add value. So once you've found these ideas and validated them, uh, add it to the portfolio, how do you think about sizing in the portfolio, um, individual names, industries, countries, how does that work? Yeah, that's, um, that's a little bit of the art uh, and there's a little bit of science to it, but there's a lot of art as well. We try to make sure that we, uh, can, at, at the very top view, we try to find think about constructing a portfolio where we have minimum variance in the cash flows of the companies we've invested in. So if we, let's suppose we have a 75 stock global portfolio with 75 companies. Um, let's suppose we merge them all together. Each one of those companies has a stream of cash flow going forward. Now, if they were all in one industry, right? The cash flows would go down at the same time, they'd come back at the same time. Obviously, that's the classic case of diversification, right? So we want to have some cash flows in that industry and some in another and some in another, and geographically will also affect that. So we want, we try to uh, construct a portfolio so that the cash flows in the companies are somewhat low correlated with one another. And, and we do that as much as possible. Of course, at the same time, the market's only giving us valuations in certain sectors or countries, which represent good value for one reason or another. So that is gonna be a big, a big departure from the typical benchmark. So from the get-go, we're gonna be uh, away from the benchmark. Now we just have to make sure that as we are away, th so those are by definition are big bets, and so we want to make sure that uh, we're not kind of outsmarting those big bets by uh, trying to overweight or underweight certain things because we're already over and underweight by definition by looking at our screens. So what we wind up doing is we equally weight the portfolios in terms of sizing. Uh, there are some, you know, 
a lot of the inefficiencies in today's markets are not in the hundred billion dollar or trillion dollar market cap stocks. Maybe those trillion dollar market cap stocks are really overvalued, but they only go up anyway. So, so it's kind of hard, <laughs> right? Uh, we've always we've all been there on the anyway. So, so we equally weight them if there if there's some small cap, uh, medium cap stocks, and we can't put a full position in, then we would make it a half position, a quarter position, whatever kind of makes sense for us. And so our 75 stock full positions might drift up to 80, 85 companies because we've mixed in some small and mid cap stocks in there that we can't put a full position on. Um, and that, that's kind of what we, what we feel. We kind of know, we know sitting here today that there's a mistake in some company in our portfolio. Uh, we, we just don't know where it is. We figure it's randomly distributed. Um, and a mistake to us is anything that doesn't perform better than the benchmark, right? So, and it could be, and theoretically, if we were brilliant and we knew where all our mistakes were, but we wouldn't make the mistakes, but we wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't be human or would be superhuman or something like that. Um, but there are some things that are just uh, unpredictable. You know, like if you, if you have an earthquake, creates a tsunami, it washes out a nuclear plant in north of Tokyo and they shut down that nuclear plant. And now the cash flows from that company dry up. And oh, by the way, the population gets extremely nervous about nuclear. So they shut down all the other nuclear plants in the country. And even if you're invested in something else, that cash flow changes. So, you know, that forecast that we had. Uh, the future forecast of the cash flows on some company could be completely unpredictable from anything that we could we could fathom. Um, so, you know, I think that that's you know that that's something that we we, we know we're going to have mistakes. So we try to diversify as much as possible, and we try not to outsmart the randomness of of markets too much. How do you think about? Uh adding and trimming and rebalancing is that is that something that you do um we obviously yeah we do that it the bulk of our of our portfolio changes come from normal portfolio turnover so we we screen we find companies we do the due diligence they come up to be a great buy idea now we have to put it in the only way we allow that to happen is if we kick something out of the portfolio and so there's this natural evolution of the portfolio. And usually what happens is that when we go to buy something, we, we take something out and that, then we, in the process of doing that, we have to uh, reconfigure the portfolios a little bit. Uh, there will be times when we buy something, it's equally, you know, it's equally weighted. Um, we hit it right, company takes off, it's overweight in the portfolio or the opposite happens like many value investors, you buy something, you think you got it timed right, but then something happens and it goes down and now it's underweight in the portfolio. Well, those underweights will tend to keep in the portfolio for a little while uh, and we'll understand what it was that made that stock stumble. And when, when it, and we can monitor that. And when that uncertainty or risk is resolved, we try to get that right and then bring it back up to full weight uh, and we're pretty good at that. We're actually very good at that. Uh, the selling is not so hard because we tend to have such pedestrian forecasts of companies' cash flows. You know, we, we know what the historic minimum and maximum margins, growth rates, pricing, volume, and so forth is in a company. And we're always kind of undercutting that in our future forecasts. And th therefore we have a buy and a sell price. Now, when the company's stock price goes up and all of a sudden we look at that, that stock price and say, what assumptions do we have to make in terms of sales margins and so forth to justify the current stock price? And when all of a sudden we're, we have to assume peak margins, we have to assume growth rates on a five or 10 year basis that they've never been able to achieve before it's pretty obvious that the stock's valuation is stretched and those are easy sell decisions. And then, then we recycle that money into new ideas as well. So, 
so we'll let it, we try to let our winners run. We try to time our losers back in uh, at the right time. And that's kind of the way we, we have managed the portfolio. Given that it's been a tougher decade for value and the U S uh, markets have been very, very strong. So uh, international equities have sort of suffered as by, by comparison, how do you feel about the coming decade for value and for international portfolios? Yeah, I mean, I, I think usually anything that underperforms for so long, uh, at some point, it's going to revert back to the mean. So I kind of feel that the, there's a certain amount of comfort uh, in that basic mathematical approach to investing. Uh, however, uh, I will say that I, th and I think this separates us in some ways from other value investors. One of the things that I, I said earlier, and we don't really talk about this because it's a little bit of a, it's a bit of a, uh, of the secret sauce that we do, but, um, you know, when, um, when we look at companies, we, we only buy companies that give us a return that's better than the expected return on the benchmark, as I said earlier. When I said that, I said that I, I, I refer to real returns after inflation returns. So we're looking at companies that have to get, beat a certain real return. When we do that, we need to forecast future cash flows in real terms, which not many people do. And when you do that, you have, kind of have to look back in the past and say, has this company been able to raise prices? Has the price per ton of paper been growing faster than inflation or has it been growing in real terms or, or negative in real terms? And I have to tell you um, that industry to industry to industry, we have found that because Moore's Law uh, has permeated the global economy so much that what you see in computer chip prices where every year they go down in nominal terms and they go down massively in real terms, that that same pricing pressure happens in the paper industry. It happens in mining. It happens in services. It happens in investment management companies, right? right? Because people use computers to price out portfolios and manage them. And that drives prices down, right? Investment fees down. And so I don't think people truly appreciate the impact that this is having on future cash flows in real terms. And so I think what a large part of the value underperformance has been for the last 10 or 15 years is this Moore's law playing out in the global economy as it's getting more and more diffused. And and I think that um, what looks optically very cheap isn't always uh, sustainable future growth in real cash flows. So I'll, I'll say that much um, in saying that I do think that value can come back. I know there's this idea that you can revert to the mean, but I think what we do differently uh, than what I think other people is that we focus extremely hard on the ability of companies to, to price their goods and services higher than inflation going forward. And that comes from innovation, uh, that, but that comes from pricing power of one sort or another. Uh, and I think, you know, we, in the last nine out of the last 11 years on our international equity mandates, we outperformed the benchmark when value had no business outperforming the benchmark. And same on global, I think we, of course we've, un, we've been underweight the US economy, the US market, which, you know, if you did that the last 10 years, you know, you're toast to begin with. But notwithstanding that, we still, I think, outperformed in six out of the last 11 years, uh, the benchmark, not just the value benchmark. So, and I think a lot of it has to do with this idea of looking at companies ability to grow cash flows in real terms. Because look, there's no, the only reason you invest in equities is not because you like to see your portfolio go up and down, you know, by 22% standard deviations a year around a, a, a six or 7% mean. The only reason you want to take that risk is because you believe that that company will grow their cash flows in real terms because if their costs go up, they can do something to either 
control those cost increases by gaining on efficiency and productivity or raise prices or do a whole bunch of other things, innovate. And it's, it's those, you know, it, it, it's that behavior in the private sector that allows cash flows to grow in real terms, which ultimately grow stock prices in real terms, right? But I think it's become a lot more difficult uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, and it's probably going to get more difficult. So we have to find companies that are, you know, that are going to be able to defeat this kind of deflationary pressures of, uh, of technology and, you know, the whole global competition, you know, people working in Cambodia and Vietnam and China and wherever who are willing to do things that in developed world countries that people, you know, get paid too much to do. And, uh, the combination of, you know, and, and central bank policy, uh, you know, has a really hard time uh, changing Moore's law, right? It has no effect, right? And, and, the, and, and for central bankers to think that by increasing the money supply or by quantitative easing, they're going to change Moore's law, good luck, you know, and they can't wave a wand that magically equalizes wage rates and productivity rates across countries. So you're always going to have these deflationary forces. And I think the, the question is, are the developed world countries and companies able to, you know, overcome those deflationary forces? So I think that that's really what, you know, what, what's the key to determining whether value is going to outperform growth and, and growth is being people pay premium for growth because cash flows are growing in real terms. And that's kind of what it's about. So uh, it's, it's not what value investing was when I came into the end of the business in the early eighties uh, when you just sort of bought pot, low PE stocks. I mean, I did my thesis under Fisher black and, you know, he, he had a page in the value line investment survey, which was, you know, which was sort of their advertisement and, and their justification for value investing. It was like buy low PE stock and it worked back then, but it's a little, a little more complicated these days with uh, technology and Moore's law and all these other things. Look, I think that's a perfect note to leave it on. Uh, Bernie, if folks want to follow along with what you're doing at Polaris, how do they go about doing that or get, or get in t contact with Polaris? Well, I suppose you can, you know, like everybody, we have a website and it's a polariscapital.com and uh you know just get us there and we've got you know we've got a relatively small firm we're a boutique we don't try to be everything for everybody uh so we we have a very small number of clients about 45 clients or so um and uh we have a lot of uh, the secret i think is to try to keep the portfolio team focused on um research and investing and getting good returns so we don't do a lot of outreach on marketing, but we do have a lot of funds. And so we try to focus people on investing in our funds and keeps us efficient. And we think the returns are better in funds anyway. So Bernard Horn, uh, Polaris Capital Management. Thank you very much. Tobias, it's wonderful to speak with you. It's a, it's a great honor and uh, thanks for having me. <laughs>